starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Hold here. Now, probably in my life, I would really need to be led by the Spirit in order to be prompted to go into the wilderness to be tempted. That's not something I'm just going to wake up and decide, well, I'm just going to go out to Bogus Basin Mountain and say, hey, let's, I'm ready to be tempted. Bring it on, baby. That's, it's not something that's really in my nature. I would prefer to not be tempted. Um, continue verse 2. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted. And that's also something that he would have to have been prompted by the Spirit to do because if I'm going up there prompted by the Spirit, I'm taking food with me. Um, and then, as I'm sure every one of us here can know, or could imagine if you were to put yourself in this place, after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, this is probably one of the most understated statements in the Bible. And he became very hungry. I would too. I, 40 days without food? I'd be hungry. But remember that, because we're going to come back to that. The Spirit bringing prompting Jesus to come out to be tempted and the fact that Jesus is hungry. Continuing on. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Wait here. What, as a, pre as a preface to these three temptations, let's take a look at kind of as a general overview, general rule as we're looking through these. Jesus, or the devil is not actually questioning Jesus' divinity. He doesn't, he knows exactly who Jesus is. He knows he's God. And him saying in each of these things, if you are the Son of God, is undermining the divinity of God in a subtle way. And at the same time, in these three temptations, there's nothing specifically wrong with each of the things uh, that he's being tempted about with the exception of what we'll point out. But what the devil is trying to do in these three temptations is getting Jesus to misuse his God-given power. He's trying to tempt Jesus to use the power that he has as God outside of the guidelines and boundaries that the Father gave him when he, came, when he sent Jesus to the earth. So reading this again, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. The, what are, what's the underlying lie in this statement, in this temptation, that you can see just if you have any underlying lies that come to your head, shut them out. If you are. If you are. If you are. That's an excellent lie. If you are. Because the devil knows and the, who Jesus is, and Jesus knows who he is too. So if you are the Son of God, that's, that's kind of an undermining, underlying lie. Is there anything else? You're not God unless you can prove it. You're not God unless you can prove it. That is a that is a strong lie in this one, and then the other three as well, uh, or the other two temptations after this one as well. And all three, that is a very strong strong lie that's woven into there. Any other lies that we can see? Yes. Uh, you don't have faith in your father. You don't have faith in your father. That. Yes, that is an underlying lie, because if we remember here, the Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness, and the Spirit prompted Jesus to fast. So, if we are looking at this lie, the devil is basically prompting Jesus, he's saying to Jesus, you have the right to meet your own needs, regardless of what God says. In spite of what he has told you, don't you deserve to have some bread? Come on, you're hungry. Like, make some of these stones bread. Feed yourself, because you know how they, you made the stones, so you know how to just morph the molecules into bread. Just say the word and it'll be done, and your meat will be met, because you're hungry. Has there been, ever been any point in our lives where we have felt as though we deserved something in order to meet a need of ours? that in spite of what Jesus says, in spite of what's written in the scriptures, that we just 
there's a need. We need to be happy. We need to be fulfilled no matter what God says in His Word. And now continuing on, look, let's look at how Jesus counters this. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus counters this specific lie with a specific truth from God's Word. Jesus answers with, The Scriptures say, it's written in the Bible. The scripture, what, where he's quoting from, is from Deuteronomy 8.3, for those of you who are interested in cross-referencing. And if Jesus felt it was necessary to counter this temptation, this lie, with scripture, why is it that we often fail to withstanding temptation? How do we typically respond when we're tempted? Do we say to ourselves, as I know I have, I know I shouldn't, I know I shouldn't, I know I shouldn't. Oops, I did. Please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then, thank you for your forgiveness. I won't do it again. Please tell me, stay away from it. Please tell me. Oh, oops, I did it again. <laughs> Jesus models here a way of counteracting temptation. And that's by using the specific truth is listed in God's word to counter the specific lie. Let's go on to temptation number two. Then the devil took Jesus and to the holy city Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, continuing on, if you are the son of God, again, giving him a little bit of a challenge there, jump off. And now the devil quotes scripture. For the scriptures say, he, referring to the Father, will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Now, what is, like, questioning out here, what are some of the lies that we can see rooted in this? <coughs> there's, there's the, if you are the Son of God again. Um, if it's like God, you're Superman. If he's the son of God, then he's Superman. Nothing can touch him. He will order his angels. What was that? Tempting. Um, testing. So basically he's telling Jesus here, and this is probably the most prevalent spot of the three temptations. He's saying, Jesus, prove yourself. Um, prove yourself. Like, show... Show me, show the world, because I already know, but show us that you're the Son of God, because jump off this, because hey, the Bible says that he will order his angels to protect you, and they won't even let your, they won't even, let's see, so you're, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone, is how this translation words it. He's, ca he's causing them to doubt the power of God, but I think even more than, um, more than doubting the power of God, as you commented on, he's questioning whether God has even got his best interests in mind. Because um, here's the lie. Didn't God have promised to take care of you? That's the he order his angels to protect you. Jesus, you need to prove yourself. You need to do something on your own to prove who you are. Because, as we all know, God will take care of you. You need to prove yourself through your own acts, through your own talents, and through your own ingenuity. Jesus, step out on a limb here and prove who you are, just to prove who you are. But uh, we all know, reading through the scriptures, if you've read anywhere past this, all of the different miracles that Jesus performed. What's different about jumping off the tallest peak in the Temple of Jerusalem as another miracle? What glory would it bring to God is for himself. That's exactly right. <laughs> this temptation is using, is this lie is basically doing it on my own. Doing something, bringing glory to myself. This is personal recognition that he's talking about. And bringing this home is, there ever been a time where you've gotten your own personal identity tied up in something that you do? In the personal accomplishments? Yeah. 
needing to prove yourself, needing to perform, 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 needing to be the best. Is there ever a point in time that that temptation has hit your life? I know that's probably one that I struggle with more than many of the other ones. And note, note here, as we go into the next verse, that Jesus doesn't pray, or he doesn't really even argue with this passage that Satan uses, that Satan quotes from Psalms. He just quotes the truth from Scripture. Jesus responded, as the Scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. He's saying here, obedience takes precedent over recognition. Performance is not the driving force of my life. Jesus is saying, I am not going to use my power for my own selfish interests. I am here to obey the Father. Obedience to the Father is taking place over recognition. How often in our lives do we come back with that saying obedience to God is better than recognition, better than accomplishment, better than the drive, drive, drive to succeed. Because that's definitely not what uh, that's definitely not what society is telling us is the most important. Sure, character and our life are important things. But, but our culture today is now pushing us and driving us and pointing us to say, well, character is good, but if you have the choice between character and the choice between success, happiness, well, money, these are the things that, that trump it all. And if you have character when you do that, that's, that's great. But, uh, and I would really love to deal with you as a business person or somebody if you have character, but, but really when it comes down to picking one or the other, it's the success, the personal success, the happiness, the wealth that, that ends up trumping in our culture. That's the pull, the drive. And Jesus here is saying, I'm choosing obedience to the Father over Maybe. personal recognition, personal accomplishment. Then, as we look at verse at the third temptation going on, theologians have kind of debated about whether uh, what exactly this third temptation is, like how it plays out, because it's a little bit different than the other two. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. Um, Jesus knows everybody who ever lived on this earth, and theologians have often debated and stated that it's possible in this temptation that the devil is able to kind of open up the expanse of time and say, hey Jesus, these are all the people you came here to save. And continuing on to verse 9. And the devil says, I will give it all to you if you kneel down and worship me. What's the lie? Doesn't have the power. Doesn't have the power. Yes? That Satan is the God of this world. That's a, a perfect lie that's right, that's tied into this. Anything else? Worship only belongs to God. Satan saying, hey, just just for a moment, turn that devotion that you have up there and just focus it for a moment on me. Look, like, basically here, we kind of see a little bit of Satan offering Jesus what we could easily call a shortcut. Hey, you know, you know that you're going to go to the cross. You know that there's going to be betrayal. You know that people are going to hate you. You know they're going to try to kill you up to thousand number of times since you just like to take people off who really think they know what they're doing. And we can just avoid all of that right now. Just take some of that devotion and just focus it on me just for a second. That's all I'm wanting. Just, just for a moment. And I can just give it all to you. That's, that's really all I wanted. That's kind of the re referencing back to heaven. That's kind of where the whole thing started. Just take some of that devotion and lean it down here. Has there ever been a time where we're tempted to shortcut, go out of God's will to kind of cut a little bit of a corner because Jesus withstood this temptation and so we know that God can forgive us. So is it really, is obedience really that? 
that necessary? It's, I, I hear some people saying that it's necessary because obedience to the Father 